here tonight. As you know, the format uh, for tonight is going to be, at least I hope for it to be, as much of a conversation as possible. Uh, so um, we will start with a brief presentation uh, by uh, Joseph Rickward, approximately half an hour. And then there will be a kind of uh, rebuttal uh, by, <laughs> by, <laughs> by uh, Richard. Uh, um, Richard and Joseph are, are old friends, and, uh, and I'm sure they've done this uh, many, many times. Uh, so uh, we're hoping uh, for, a, for a good match. Um, uh, Joseph Rickworth has just uh, recently published a book called The Seduction of Place, The City in the 21st Century. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very important book because I think after so many conversations in the 70s and 80s, it's really again one of the few books that, that returns to the topic of urbanism. There's been a lot of discussion about urbanism in the sense of how we find our cities um, and the kind of joys and discoveries of, of, of in a sense, instantaneous cities. Uh, but Joseph has uh, gone and relied on his uh, wonderful uh, knowledge of uh, so many cities, of so many buildings, and of history, and really uh, produced a book which is uh, demanding of us to uh, rethink the question of city and city building and uh, how we really construct um, uh, our cities. Um, so it's, it's, it's in a sense, uh, I would have thought, much more proactive than many other interpretation or observations that uh, one finds in uh, so much of uh, the uh, uh, other writings uh, about the city. Um, Joseph Rickworth uh, is uh, the Paul uh, Philip Cray uh, Professor of Architecture and Emeritus at the University of Pennsylvania. Before that, he was at Cambridge. Before that, he was at Essex. Among his books are The First Moderns, The Architects of the 18th Century, The Idea of a Town, the Anthropology of uh, Urban Form in Rome, Italy, and the Ancient World, on Adam's House in Paradise, the idea of the primitive hut uh, in architectural history, and a new translation uh, for, of uh, 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 Alberti's On the Art of Building in 10 books, uh, The Dancing Column, more recently The Villa, his collection of essays, The Necessity of Artifice, which is one of my favorite books, and so on and so forth. So, the list goes on. Also, I think uh, uh, Richard Sennett has been responsible so for some really key and important books that I think have, have widened our understanding of the city of urbanism and our responsibilities within the public realm. I remember myself being so uh, much um, influenced, in a sense, by uh, the fall of public man the, the, the whole discussion of our actions and uh, responsibilities in public space. Uh, the, his book, Uses of Disorder, um, more recently, uh, Flesh and Stone, and again, the list goes on. Uh, it's fortunate that uh, Richard has recently moved to London where he uh, teaches at the LSC in the cities program. Uh, but uh, I would like to take this opportunity now to uh, welcome my teacher, my friend, Joseph Rickworth, uh, to talk to us about the seduction of place. Joseph. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to have a conversation with all of you, but I wish I could take you all one by one and have a conversation. That would be very nice. But not, can't be done, I think, tonight. However, um, I can't live up to Moisson's introduction, but I'll try and do my best. Uh, and I think I should perhaps start that what this book, by saying that what this book is about, is in fact flesh and stone. And if Richard weren't so naughty and hadn't pinched that title, that's what it had been called. But there it is, it's called flesh and stone, uh, it's called the seduction of place and <laughs> no harm in that. <laughs> Um, because it also is about that, and of course place is always seductive. Um, walking just now, just before we came down here through this building, um, it was very familiar. It's a long time since I was a revolting student here, but it's 
the feel of it, even with all the changes, the feel of the building, uh, the placing of certain things in it, like the gents upstairs and so on, are all terribly familiar, and um, I possess them, as it were. They are part of my memory, and uh, as long as I shall have a memory, they will not be eradicated. So I am seduced also by Bedford Square. But what I want to talk about is really on the edge of what the book's about, because the book's there, and um, if you want to, you can all read it. Um, and of course, it is true, as somebody once remarked, that although the truth has been said, it has to be repeated over and over again, because nobody was listening. Uh, so it does to repeat what one has written and to explicate it. But I really want to look at the edges of it. And so I'll start with my slides, because it's easiest when one is trained as an architect and one's talking to architects, it's easiest to talk when one's got pictures to look at. So let me start with a familiar picture. You all know the Mother of Parliament. Um, it's, there it is, it was built in the national style after the Great Fire of 1834, and a splendid building it is in many ways, awkward in others. And opposite it, half a century or, or a bit more after it was built, was built what was really the, to be the cathedral of local government, county hall. It was built for the London County Council, but it was actually intended to be facing Parliament, the ultimate incarnation of local government in this country, which had grown in power through the 19th century. Now, you know what has happened. Um, the Ferris wheel is an excellent thing. It's a bit like um, the hare in Goethe's soup, which he pulled out and said, ah, a, a woman's hair, a beautiful thing in the right place. And the same can be said about the Ferris wheel. A beautiful thing in the right place. Colonel Ferris um, of Troy, NY, was used to um, seeing bucket, bucket wheel pumps. And the um, students at the Ransler Polytechnic used to play with a, there's a very big bucket wheel pump, uh, very near Troy. And he thought it, it turned to an honest penny by adapting it to a fairground contraption. And indeed, it's, I mean, those of you who have seen The Third Man will remember that it has sort of monumental possibilities. And had it been sighted elsewhere, uh, it would have been a splendid thing. But since it's sighted where it is, Sorry, the slide's so pale, but you see it dominates the view. This is from Lambeth Bridge. Um, between the two centres of government, what it's saying, really, is we are the Windsor theme park, as private eye keeps on telling us. We are the theme park. We are not really a serious place which is governed by local government and, and parliament and so on. Uh, the important thing dominates is the Ferris wheel. And of course at the other end of the river we have uh, Canada Place and those two markers in London are telling us what Mrs. Thatcher uh, proclaimed to us very loudly that Britain can no longer be productive, that it is a service economy and that it will rely increasingly on the tourist trade. Um, I had thought that our present masters and lords uh, were not in harmony with this notion, but it is they who, after all, accepted this kind of ordering as part of the picture which we make of ourselves. And this is actually I think this is something which is crucial to our understanding of the city because 
whatever we build is, of course, works and has to be uh, used and has also to be economic. That sometimes, if you read the accounts of the economics of um, state development, you sometimes wonder if this has to be economic. Um, but at any rate, it's, it is thought that it must in some way be rational or have a rational justification. But it is also metaphoric. Because if there's one thing that distinguishes man from other creatures that inhabit the globe, is that he realized at some point, which we don't know and we don't understand, that things can mean that uh, metaphor is part of our being. Uh, and it was Claude Lévy Strauss many years ago who said, and I've never seen it contradicted, um, that meaning could not be something that dawned gradually on humanity. Once you realize that something can mean something else, there is no going back. And I think that's something which is essential to the understanding of architecture. There is no going back. I know that some recent smart theorists have told us that in the late capitalist society, which is meaningless, uh, the important thing about architecture is that it should be totally abstract um, and totally meaningless. But they forgot a rather important little essay of Hans Arps, which is addressed to his fellow abstract artists, and which says, whatever you do, however careful you are, one day there'll be a face in your picture. Don't let it frighten you. Everybody has that experience. So even the most severe and uh, thoroughgoing abstract painters will find occasionally that there is something which suggests an image, a figure, a something which they can't quite control. And that's really what I think we have to understand about cities. Now, unlike us, the Australians have proceeded in a rather different way. Sydney, as I'm sure you know, uh, for many years, gloried in its bridge. And as Sydney grew, the ambitions of the Australians also grew. And they wanted to present themselves to the world, not as just um, this rough people, but as a people with an ambition, a cultural ambition. And therefore, at the center of the most important city, um, Sydney, I know it's not the capital, but it is in many ways still the most important city in Australia, they put a rather ostentatious, if you like, opera house. Wherever you are in round the bay of Sydney, that opera house strikes you as a much more important building than the high buildings behind it. They have done, in a sense, the opposite of us. Where we have put the Ferris wheel between the centers of government, they have put an opera house as their, as it were, uh, the prow of their ship of state. Now, um, abstraction. I'm going to be a bit episodic, so uh, I hope you'll forgive me, but there's something that hasn't been pointed out about that. Uh, and here is a city which claims to be wholly rational. Some of you will recognize it, it's Brasilia. Uh, and it's viewed from the high point, the high point which is where the television town or radio transmitters stand. But, um, where is this? Hmm? Yeah, I'm standing right on top, looking down on the Avenue of the Ministries and the Parliament building at the very end. And uh, if you look to the right, you will see the cathedral. Now, when you go inside the cathedral, you are met with an extraordinary display of kitsch. That um, sectioned hard-boiled egg over the high altar is meant to symbolize the resurrection, I am told. And to the side of it, 
you have a fiberglass cast <laughs> of the Michelangelo Pietà. But you may say, all right, that's religiosity and it's fair enough. But if you go to that place where we've just been, looked down on Brasilia from, you will find this rather curious building. Um, I don't quite know what to call it. It's the Mastaba of President Kubitschek, the founder of the city. And there he is standing on that extraordinary exclamation mark, whose meaning escapes me. Um, and you will see that there is a kind of mushroom thing on top, and that is, in fact, over the actual coffin of the president. He is um, encased in, um, I think, a stone. It light is rather peculiar. There's rather underneath that dome there is red glass. Uh, so when you come, when you go into this curious building, you have to go and, like the cathedral, it has no entrance. So you have to go in underneath it through a tunnel, through underneath that altar. And you come up into something that looks like a, a, a club class airport lounge. And from that you go into the chamber underneath the red glass, where there's a scopulus, just labelled Offen Dador. And then beyond that you go into a museum of mementos of the president. So even this display of rational uh, herbalism requires these curious accidents. And they even have a rather curious, rather odd side effect. Just outside Brasilia, adjoining it, is a military academy. Now, seeing this rather strange building, which is a large hall, I said to my guide, this is obviously based on some very, very interesting calculations. This is obviously a very interesting structure. And you might say, think the same. Oh, no, no, he said, that's not a at all. You see, what that is, is M for military. <laughs> so M for military becomes a great monument. It's visible as you drive past the military academy. You can see it from everywhere. Um, and the mausoleum of Kubitschek sits on top of Brasilia uh, and presides over it in this rather lugubrious fashion. But we do have a great problem with the way in which we are to make cities more than just housing. Uh, this is a square which became notorious in Barcelona, the Plaza de los Palmares, it's on the outskirts, and the mayor decided um, that something must be done about that. And the way he thought that would be managed is by placing a major work of art by a major artist in it. He was very tickled by the fact that there was an artist in New York who carried the same name as himself to its Serra. So Richard Serra was invited to produce a solution for the square, and there it is. The palms are at one end. Uh, Serra's contribution is a curved wall. And uh, to the right, where there are those stripes, you see a kind of thing that looks like a ladder on plan, and it is, in fact, a large construction containing the lighting for the square. That is Sarah's concept sketch. There is the uh, um, wall with children playing ball on that rather hard surface, actually. There it is, full of people. Uh, it's very ostentatious, but very um, strikes one uh, when one looks at the photograph. But actually, when you're in it, it doesn't it doesn't register very much. Can I go backwards? Yeah. It registers more like that than like that. So, in fact, what happened was that the locals 
looking at it sideways, saw that this construction carrying the lighting, the searchlights, uh, was the important object in the square. So in fact, if you ask the locals what Serra's contribution to the square was, many of them will tell you that was this construction and not the wall. And I think Serra is a kind of emblematic artist for the way in which art lives in the city. Because you probably all know his other problem, the problem of the tilted arc, which was put in the Federal Plaza in New York, in downtown New York, by a commission of museum directors and art historians. Uh, interestingly enough, the architects, there were bad architects, but even then, the architects were not consulted and throughout the proceedings were not represented. But the proceedings were long. The locals, a group of locals objected. It's not quite clear whether this, the objections were orchestrated or not, but there, was, there were certainly strong objections. And after a long um, law case, uh, one night the city authorities came with saws and lorries and cut it into three pieces. It was 60 foot long, so it couldn't be taken away in one piece. Cut it into three pieces and put it in the warehouse. Um, now, whether uh, the objection to this was orchestrated or not, it was actually uh, a very interestingly awkward element in the square. You see how it goes across the paving. Um, and you see the edge of the federal building and you see how really not, um, how it's not really very much an exemplary building. But at any rate, it's very interesting that it was seen as a totally isolated element in the city. And when Sarah was asked to defend it and his lawyers drew up the defense, um, his defense was uh, freedom of speech. It was not that he was making a contribution to the city. It was not that what he was doing was beautiful or that it enhanced um, the square in which it stood. It was that this object, the 60-foot piece of steel, <coughs> was an utterance. And that if it was taken away or in some way removed, it, he was being denied his freedom of speech. And I think that in itself is a very interesting and important uh, factor in the way we understand our city. That is that the artist does not contribute, that the artist makes an utterance. And that utterance, as it were, signifies his freedom. Therefore, if we take it away, remove it, if we in some way uh, make off with it in take it out of circulation, we are denying his freedom of speech. I think this is something we should perhaps discuss. But the way in which we see monuments is, is um, has always been problematic. Um, many of you will know of the destroyed statues in the pagan temples which the early Christians did away with. Uh, many of you will know of the great statue Michelangelo did of Pope Julius II for Bologna, which was melted down when the papal power was driven out from Bologna. But um, that maltreatment is also part of the way in which monuments are in the city. I happen to photograph this because it was a, a, a glaring instance of that. It's the statue of the Empress Josephine in Fort de France in Martinique, which Napoleon III had erected in memory of his aunt. Uh, but in Martinique, she's remembered for something rather different than her connection with, with, the, with, the, with the imperial family. She's remembered for the fact that she persuaded Napoleon not to enfranchise the slaves in Martinique, where her family had a lot of slaves. Um, and to, when slaves were freed, in the French Republic, in, still under the consulate, uh, Martinique was exempted from that law. 
So at a certain point, she lost her head one night. And it stands there as a monument to that particularly oppressive uh, reign in Martinique. Uh, that, of course, extends to other things, and we now have a general problem with the way in which monuments are imposed objects. That is why wherever monuments appear, there is, I, this is, ju just happens to be something I photographed, I don't, it's of no particular significance, but wherever you will find uh, hoardings put up by authority, you will find objections to them. Um, I think there is a kind of dialogue between the advertisement, which is an antisocial element in the city, and the graffito, which is also an antisocial element but of a different kind in the city. So there is a, a, a constant dialogue between that, and it's that dialogue which, in a way, in the 20th century city has become a rather important element. Uh, people tend to, and the value it. Uh, my editor in New York wanted to remove all mentions of graffitis from the book. She said, just spoiled city kids do that. Uh, but it's, I think it's a rather important factor, and I think the relationship between the graffito and the advertisement is something we haven't looked at sufficiently. Now, it's, um, there's something which Richard has picked on, and this is, this is really for him, um, and that is the, uh, m my sense that what the city should do for us is that it should tell us that it wants to be just. And it can only tell us that by looking as if it was wanting that. Now, our justice is not everybody else's justice. Uh, this is the house of the governor in a city in Minas Gerais in Portugal called Mariana. And in front of it you see a little monument. As I say, it's not our kind of justice. It's the monument in, which, in front of which, uh, or by, by being chained to which, escaped slaves were whipped, and in front of which people who were condemned to death were decapitated. It is, however, the um, column of justice. It is there to say we want our justice represented in this way. It's all this that we're looking at here is, is quite late. These buildings are, belong to the second half of the 18th century. Brazil was part of the Portuguese empire still, and they have it on the right with the two churches on either side of it. It's the main square of the city. But in the center, and this is something which, uh, which is demanded by the laws of the Indies, which were promulgated by Philip II 250 years before this was done, that in the center of the city there should be a court of justice and there should be a place of public execution in front of it. That justice should be seen to be done. As I say, it's not our kind of justice, but it is a justice of a certain kind. And in case there's any mistake, the emblem of justice, the scale, the scales, the sword, and the globe are there on it. Right. Not our kind of justice, not our kind of ideology. Most of you will know this building. It's the headquarters of the fascist party, which Giuseppe Terani built in Como in the 1930s. He was a great architect working for an ignoble ideology. But the building is not ignoble. 
and it still stands as part of the city fabric of that rather curious out of the way town. An ignoble ideology can leave a noble heritage. At the first time I went to see it, I went with an Italian friend uh, who brought me there on a motorbike, and we it, it had by then been divided between the four main parties of Italy. And the top floor was communist. So we went up to the top floor, and somebody stopped us and said, what are you doing here? And we said, we were architects, we've come to look at the building. There's nothing to learn from this architecture, he said very firmly. <laughs> but as you see, um, architects still go and look at it. It's now 75 years old. It's still a majestic monument. Uh, the ideology is ridiculed, but the monument is not. And the relationship between ideology, monument, and justice may be something we should talk about. Thank you very much. So, um, Richard, as I said, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll be able to uh, maybe pick up on some of the issues and, and then we could open it to a conversation and, and go from there. Okay, yeah? fine. Okay. Um, well, let me begin just where Joseph ended and explain to you why the this issue about um, uh, architecture and justice uh, came to my mind. This book, which really I embarrassed my old friend by saying it is a really remarkable book, has in one of its chapters called First Aid uh, a long documentation about how architects uh, and urbanists uh, who are visually minded try to deal with the coming of capitalism to uh, Western cities and the evils of capitalism that it produced. Uh, the first date is a description of uh, 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 socialist, neo-Marxist, anarcho-syndicalist responses to the advent of capitalism. The chapter that comes after it is specifically about the problem of housing. And uh, what do you do about the shack the unintended uh, uh, kind of housing that just grow, grew up at the edge of cities with their capitalist expansion. I think Joseph has been rather modest in uh, laying out his concern on this subject. And then at the, towards the end of the book, he asks a question, and I thought this is where we might begin this discussion. He says this on page 228. If there is one ought about the city, it is that the city has to ensure that justice be done by its citizens. What that might mean in detail and how it is to be achieved will of course be disputed, whose justice is a question that's often asked nowadays. A few people would take the argument further and demand that their city should also look just. And would know what you mean, meant should you suggest it. Justice, as the old legal saw has it, must not only be done, it must be seen to be done. Uh, now, 
it seems to me the question, maybe this is one way to start, that you're posing is why did that impulse of 19th century architects to create an architecture of justice which responded to the great transformation of social and material facts of urban life wind up uh, with images like Brasilia rather than images of what a house should be like, what a per poor person's square should be like. How is it that artists who built for the public could conceive of their own rights as being more primary uh, than making places for poor people? I think it's that kind of question which, not only this passage, but really the drift of this book opens up to me. And I hope you can explain this. <laughs> uh, explain I, uh, my sort of, my, my business really. I'm, I'm more in the business of asking than in the business of explaining. But, uh, but what would an architecture of justice be? Well, let me go back to your, uh, the problem of the squatters, because of course the thing about Brasilia is that it is, um, it, it claims to be a wholly rational creation. Um, that is, it is, it is, wholly rational is perhaps overstating it, but it claims to be a rational arrangement of elements. Um, I quoted the business of M for military that if you look at the two towers of, uh, of the, um, by the parliament building, they also have curious sort of literary allusions of that kind. Um, but the point about Brasilia is that it is ordered, that everything, this is why it's so difficult. It is also the most violent city, one, one of the most violent cities in the world. Uh, I think I, I say it in the book, that uh, uh, my guide to Brasilia lives in a sort of Japanese-style house, but he keeps two rock pilers uh, in a kind of concrete compound because he's very unsafe, you know, he's got to protect himself. Uh, and Brasilia is a very, very violent city, and it is surrounded by huge uh, squatter settlements, of which, um, from the beginning, the government wanted to uh, not allow, and then of course they were forced to allow them, uh, and in fact the people who live in Brasilia um, are served by the people who live in the squatters, the squatter districts, and who of course also robbed them and murdered them. Um, a similar thing has happened to Celebration Florida. The, um, the, uh, the town is beautifully manicured. I don't know how many of you have seen the Truman Papers, but um, it's very much like the seaside of the Truman Papers. Um, and I'm sure that anyone who looks unkempt will be picked up by the police on his way into the town, because it is, although it's not gated in the sense that you don't have to show your pass as you go in, but it's got gates. And as you go in, uh, you are, I'm sure, observed. And of course, the people who live, who work there, people who work in the restaurants, the people who work, who clean and so on, don't live in celebration. They live in the nearby town, just to be called Cow Town, it's now called Kissimmee. Uh, it's a lot of curious name, I'm not quite sure how it came about. But it is a normal strip, um, Florida town of that kind. So um, when you set up the rational enclave, it has to have the irrational opposite to serve it. Um, but what I wonder... We've never worked that out, have we? No. I mean, what I wonder about this is that... Um, I mean, 19th century, 19th century urbanists and architects who had with a political conscience really believed that a kind of rational architecture would do, not just be seen to be do, do, do justice, would do justice to what was essentially an irrational process. Their notion of capitalism was that it was inherently ir irrational. 
uh, illogical, uh, arbitrary, and that the assertion of rational form was a kind of defi, how do you say it? It's a kind of defiance of the notion of power itself. It seems to me what's happened is that all these terms have been turned around in the last century. And uh, the pursuit of architectural order uh, gets to look like a kind of, of complicity with this unjust city rather than a defiance of it. And the question it then raises is, what would a kind of architecture of mess, chaos, disorder look like which would uh, challenge it? Now, I can just say something about this. <laughs> this is not the first time we've talked about this question and probably won't be the last time. Uh, in my bailiwick, on the social side of thinking about, about this question, the assumption has been if you just let a city run, its natural processes of movement, change, alteration, if these are unregulated, that what you will create is a street architecture which better serves the needs of poor people. This is inherently the argument of of our friend Jane Jacobs, which is that it's the intrusion of, of rational design which is inherently complicit with this capitalist order. I th think I? they, I th think we couldn't believe what she believes anymore. Good, I've got you just, going. Just, I knew you yeah, would well. get enough. No, one thing is that I think I, I've got to say something in, in, in support of Oscar Niemeyer since I think a few years ago, at least three years ago, uh, we did give uh, an honorary AA diploma to Oscar Niemeyer. You didn't. And we did. Um, oh, God. And I think in many respects I'm... You I'm didn't call me. Oh, well. <laughs> and in many respects I'm very proud of the fact that we did give uh, um, an honorary degree. I, I think... Um, I think that, that to ask this question in terms of um, uh, what is the architecture of what is the architecture that is just going to look like in a, in a sense uh, runs a little difficulty or runs the danger um, in my mind of putting you back uh, too quickly or too directly uh, within a territory of representation where. Uh, there needs to be then very direct kind of equivalences between certain conceptions, let's say, of justice, of right, and so on, and what the representation of these things are. And of course, there is always, ultimately, a certain just representation of these things. But the, the point is, at what point does this representation occur? So, for example, in the case of, 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 of Niemeyer, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely possible to say, as a vision of urbanism, there are many of the things that I think Joseph has rightly pointed out might be seen uh, to be problematic as a city, as a place that, for that, that, that is, yes, for, for the justice of its citizens. At the same time, I think people like Lucio Costa and, and Oscar Niemeyer were responsible for some of the most kind of creative uh, acts uh, within uh, architecture and spatial design, whether you're looking at individual houses, certain projects, they really did produce uh, some things. And so I think it's this balance, and I think it touches more on, for example, the question of the Casa del Fascio, where Terrani's project on one level has a certain sort of ideological bent, and then it has certain qualities and certain spatial conditions that are despite all the, all the kind of historicity that are, that are associated to it. So I think what, what to return to the question, if we are to go, in one sense, beyond the kind of argument that I think Rossi, for example, made, right. where in the architecture of the city, he really did try to present a certain vision of a, of a city which was very directly representational of its institutions. And now, we have to confront, we have to acknowledge that there is a certain city that has to address its, uh, its multiplicity of of conflictual representations. It cannot then be a representation of justice in, in direct terms, but it has to have certain conditions that allow, 
that are just in a way. And that I think de-emphasizes the lookability or the imageability of the project in, mm. in, in my opinion. And one has to then discuss, for example, what is, what is just in terms of housing, what is just in terms of the co conditions of public space and so on. And I think when you do that, it would be an architecture which is less directly representational and imagistic. And this is one of, one of the things that I think Joseph is really also Struggling. arguing yeah. and, and dealing with and addressing not to try to make the kind of one-to-one -one equation between image and representation, but one that really construct the kind of circumstances that might lead to this question of justice. But I'm not going to... Well, this is your pigeon, but I'll, I'll just... <laughs> you should that one. Yeah, all right. <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think, Moisin, you really put in a way you put your, your finger on, on, to me, what is the, the visual issue here, which, and it has to do with things like what happens when you allow people in favelas to build their own housing and, and so on, which is if we think about justice being seen to be done, in, in really extreme conditions of injustice today. What that does mean is a sacrifice of the image. And mm -hmm. I think you can, this favela housing is a very uh, dramatic example of that. Mm -hmm. You know, there is, the architect gives the means and the, the people who live in the favelas build whatever they can out of that. The ultimate image is not controlled. But well, what I would say about this is, what if you just push this one step further? What if you looked at empowerment for people in a city as, as a condition in which they weren't confronted with the complete? That you had a kind of architecture which, as, as in the pre-capitalist city was often the case, which could be endlessly adapted, moved around, I mean the Georgian terrace block is, is a, I don't know if it had an inventor, but it is a piece of uh, urbanistic genius. Endlessly manipulable as people's lives change and so on. That is a kind of architecture of, a, of justice because it respond, the, the buildings can actually respond to their habitation. And, and I would say it's exactly what you're talking about. You lose the notion that there's a defined image. The architect is more like a kind of provider of materials mm -hmm. which gets sorted out in, in, in time. So, sort of, I mean, in a way, I agree with you sort of coming around this other side, but this is your pigeon. You wrote this book. <coughs> yeah, I did, yeah. <laughs> Two microphones in stereo. Um, <laughs> well, um, however irrational, whatever, it, it is what, what people build for themselves, they still need infrastructure. Right. Certainly in the late 19th and the 20th century, we expect mains water, electricity, drains. And those are uh, provided by some form of authority, local government, uh, central government, whatever. Now, the way they are laid is actually determining of city structure. I think we tend to underestimate the fact that many, many suburbs of the cities of the world, not just Europe, but all over the world, were actually, in a sense, designed by sanitary engineers. They laid the tubing underneath the ground, and they made the pattern within which architects built. It's the unconscious governing the city in yet another fashion. Uh, and we haven't found a way of talking to sanitary engineers, not even to traffic engineers, that would rationalize our concerns. But is, but is it the engineers or is it the, the, the government? I mean, it's, it's, the Labour, it's the Labour Party that's trying to privatize everything which then makes it very difficult to really have any kind of social infrastructure which will be for the citizens. Once everything is privatized, then it's really not in the benefit of rail track to provide any more infrastructure if it's not financially. 
beneficial. I mean, that's the kind of dilemma of... Uh, of but this is, I mean, I think in a way that that's absolutely true. But let me put this to you another way. Um, most of the time when we have discussions about, about social political issues in cities, I notice with architects that this feeling, well, it's, you know, it's, this isn't really my bailiwick, you know, I am merely but a pencil and so on. And one of the things I've become really convinced in my old age is that in fact the act of design is inherently political. Mm. Any, uh, that, now this may just be because we found no social solutions for capitalism, you know, all sociologists turn to architects. But I, I mean, I think there is a, there's a more fundamental issue here. And I think you've really put your, your finger on it, which is that what the, the greater clarity, the greater representation we have of what a space should be like may in fact be in a way not an architecture of justice. And the less defined, determinate, the more the materials that an engineer gives become the architecture, uh, the, perhaps that is more an architecture of justice. But it would require a kind of, as far as I understand this, a kind of rethink of the act of, of building. Uh, that is, how do you make a building truly flexible? You, um, the Americans among you will know that the least flexible buildings in Manhattan are office blocks that have been put up since the Second World War. They're almost impossible to convert to residential uses. I mean, all the habits we have mm -hmm. of building are, uh, and of building the tower, for instance, as, as, as an economic <coughs> object, are these fixed use, uh, fixed image objects. It seems to me we get it into Joseph's question by really trying to understand a different kind of architecture, not just politics of, of, of it, but actually a kind of architecture which is not, if I dare use the word, fascistic. Could I maybe try and yeah. open up the conversation? Yeah, maybe can we get the microphone? Um, these, these debates and I hear these things that are going on in Australia over the weekend where we were discussing German architecture and indeed um, Jewish memorials in Germany and so on. Um, it, it strikes me that, that architects have this problem with morality, um, that somehow they perceive that a good architecture will produce a good society and this leads to books like David Watkins' Architecture and Morality. Now, that, to me, it seems the two problems here. Firstly, what is good architecture? And from Petrugius onwards, we've, all definitions of beauty have been based on notions of morality. You know, quid decia, top prefron, and so on. It has to be appropriate, it has to be whatever else. You know, it's, it's very much a moralistic sort of debate. But the second side is, is this notion that somehow that architecture will automatically engender a good society. Now, I think the person who's really interesting on this, on this subject is this Foucault, who um, has discussed as an extension of discussion about the panopticon, about what brings about a, a, a society, of, a liberal society, for example. And he's quite sort of clear on this, and he says it doesn't belong to the order of things to guarantee the practice of, of, of liberty. The practice of liberty, liberty is the practice of liberty. What architecture can do is, to some extent, facilitate or prevent that practice of liberty. So I mean, he sort of like, you know, I think very usefully sort of opens up the question of, of how architecture can enable or otherwise practices. But I think one has to try and dissociate um, an aesthetic from, from a political sort of question. Um, I think, you know, I agree with Richard that it's, it's, in some sense design is, is, is political, but it's kind of like, to me, it's what, it, what politics it, it enables. Another example I think of is, is um, the Karl Marx Allee um, in, in Germany, um, right. which is always when the architect views political terms to talk about architecture, it's totalitarian or it's revolution or whatever. 
Well, to my mind, what is totalitarian about the Karl Marx Alley was the fact that when it was built, um, there were 12 workers killed um, in the protests when it was brutally put down by authorities. They were protesting against, against the, the, um, the, the conditions and so on. Or possibly the type of, type of totalitarian regime that might be, late, might be allowed to operate within that sort of space. So I think to me, to my mind, I think to bring in Foucault at this point, and rather than to treat it as a question of aesthetics, but more a question of the kind of spatial arrangements that may facilitate um, political questions is maybe useful. Well, I think uh, the, the Foucault distinction of orders is a very important one, and I'm glad you brought it up, because of course the fact that you design buildings which you may think are a bit end doesn't stop you from voting for the wrong party. Uh, you are political in two ways. You are political as a pencil, as it were, and you're political as a human being, as a citizen. You have those two ways of operating are not separate, but they are quite different. They, are, they, they, they have different modalities. So, of course, I agree entirely with Richard, all building, building every time is a political act. It involves you in social interaction, whether you like it or not. But it doesn't prevent you from, I mean, it doesn't absolve you from being involved in the political life of the city. I use city in, in a general term. There are two orders of things. Uh, and now, I have problems with the word aesthetic, as I'm sure you know, Neil. So uh, I'm not going to <laughs> go into that. Uh, but, uh, but I do think that uh, ultimately, what we have to offer as architects to not just to our individual clients, but to the society which is our ultimate client. And in that sense, Tehrani's clients are not the fascist party, but the city of Congo. Uh, what we have to offer them is our ability to make form out of their concerns. Uh, and whether you like to call that an aesthetic procedure or not, I don't know. I would hesitate to call that. Um, how do you estimate the quality of a building? We live in the rain quantity, as you know, so we can only quantify our values. Uh, it's always been a problem. Uh, the French Academy uh, of Architecture spent 200 years debating the issue of taste and never reached a conclusion when it was dissolved. So we don't really know what taste is, or how it is governed, or how it is acquired, or what its modes of operations are. Most of us will agree, and that's the best we can do, on what is a good building and what is not. Uh, you may call that agreement aesthetic, uh, but ultimately I feel about that rather like Barnett Newman felt about Barnett Newman was once asked what um, his aesthetic was, and he said, aesthetics is for us what ornithology is for the birds. Mm. Um, now, um, <laughs> that's how I see it. Aesthetics is what people say when they experience it. Um, what I do is something else, and has only a very marginal relationship what is generally called aesthetic. Mm. Also, your reading of Foucault then ends up, in a way, prioritizing or separating the political from the spatial, which so much of what he's working, what he was working towards, is the entanglement of the spatial as political. In which, in which case, it's not, it's not possible to see one coming before the other. If you see it like that, you're then back into a kind of you know, old-fashioned uh, politics or old-fashioned socialism where the politics has to be right before, you've got to get the ideas correct before you do the architecture. And surely then that leaves very little optimism in for, for, for architecture as a kind of imagination which by definition is, has within it the possibility of certain democratic procedures. Otherwise then, you know, it, it would be pos if one follows the logic of your argument, it might be possible to say that, for example, democracy does not require building. And one of the things that surely comes from Foucault is that 
you know, democracy is by definition a special project. Let me just let the second respond to that. Um, no, I think Foucault's point is that you have to see it you know, in league with each other. But just as, you know, for example, the, the laying out of, of America, according to the grid, did not guarantee a democratic society. Sure. So we find the grid being used, as we spoke about the weekend, for the, the concentration camp. Um, so you know, uh, his point is, uh, Foucault's point is, is that architecture can facilitate the uh, action of certain politics when it is in league with, those, with, with that politics. So for example, the panopticon makes a very good prison because it allows it to act in a political sort of regime. But I tend to go along with, with people like um, uh, Manfred Tef Manfredo Tefuri, who makes it quite clear that you know, the architect can act as a political, political person, but the architecture itself can't be political. And I think it's pretty sure, But that's, that's also to assume that the grid is the architecture, which it isn't. But anyway. Uh, well, the mention of Foucault is the other thing that Joseph and I wanted to talk about, and I realize this takes us towards the cocktail hour, and in New York, people would be streaming into bars at 7.30, but, but it, it is something we wanted to talk about, and I hope you'll, you'll bear with us for a few moments. And then is the preoccupation that both of us have had with the relationship between uh, uh, body and building. And I have to say that the book of Joseph's, which I think is in some sense the most radical and provoking of his many, many books, his book, The Dancing Column. Uh, it's uh, very complicated and uh, uh, very historically rich book, which really breaks a lot of new ground in thinking about the ways when we use the term embodiment, uh, just what that, that act of embodiment, physical embodiment, is like. And um, so I have a couple of questions as an admirer of this book, and also uh, since it's a subject that interests me, a couple of questions I'd like to ask you. Actually, I want to say one thing about this relation to urbanism. I think where the kind of dis discussion that you and Moisson are having gets to be concrete in terms of aesthetics and its relation to politics actually um, uh, gets a kind of definition when um, you start thinking about questions of, of embodiment. I, and I'll give you an example. Uh, I, I'm hoping to get started here with a group of dancers and choreographers uh, in London. Uh, somehow, if we can ever find a way to do it. A kind of research group on movement. Uh, dance is nothing but a thinking about movement. And most urbanites' experience of the city, tactile experience of the city, is predicated on, on movement. We have very little discussion between people who make movements in everyday life and people who design movements on on the stage. That is, if you like, is a very aesthetic discussion. Most of these choreographers that I've been talking to, uh, Foucault we, would mean nothing to them. I mean, they have no theory. Why should, why should they? And yet there's implicit in that kind of thinking about movement, something that would relate to us about, uh, to, to make sense to us about how we go about liberating people's movement every day in the Street. And that's, I just raise this because it, it's, a, for me, the question of why Joseph's preoccupation with embodiment and the relation between buildings and bodies has a real political uh, dimension to it. Having said that, my question to you is as follows, and it's, it's a real simple question. Do you feel that modern architecture, of the sort, say, that you showed us this beautiful uh, the last bill, the fascist uh, uh, has lost contact with or found a different kind of embodiment, body relationship, than the kinds of architecture that your columns, orders, and so on, that you're dealing with in uh, the dancing column. Is this a new kind of, of embodiment 
Or is it a disembodiment? A kind of, if you were just to talk a little more about, about the, the fascist headquarters, what is its bodily dimension for you? Most of your writing has been about this long, long history of, of this metonymy between the column standing form and sitting form. Anyhow, that's a question. Is modernism disembodied? Let me ask you some well, um, it's something that has worried uh, architects, some architects, for a long time. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Corbusier's meditations on that subject in the books on the, on the book on Modulo, and the various reproaches that were made, for instance, that Modulo is based exclusively on the male body, whereupon he produced a female Modulo. Um, but I think he was perhaps more interested, more concerned than uh, his contemporaries with that particular issue. If you want an architect of that period who was not concerned with it and didn't see it as a problem, there's Mies van der Rohe, who is uh, concerned only with the way in which the building is fabricated, not with the way it relates to its visitors, to its uh, this is why, why in that book that Mies mentioned, from that Cetio Artifice, you will find photographs of uh, the Seagram building um, insulting its visitors and telling lies to its neighbors. Because I think it is a building which is essentially totally isolated, totally um, an object placed in an environment which is presumed to be hostile. Now, um, as is that the answer. Yes, in, in fact, uh, the business of relating to the texture around it has also something to do with the body feeling. The body feeling we proceed from one place to another. We've not talked, not mentioned this evening, Kevin Lynch at all, but he was in a sense concerned with that, what Neil calls the aesthetic aspect of, of looking at buildings. That is, he's concerned with the way buildings are received by the common visitor. Uh, it's unfortunate that that's never been extended, but I think that's actually uh, a very important piece of research. But it suffers from exactly what Weissen was talking about. That is, it's a represent his notion about the reception is not use, but that representational image. But how else do you study use except through representation? Touch, okay. Well, smell. Yes, but that's all part. Of, that's all part of the representation. Ah. I think there is a question uh -huh. way uh, back there. Who is cute? Do you really think that? You don't think it's just? Is this on? Yes, yeah. please. Uh, I, I'd like to bring this back to the question you started. When you posed the question about justice, it sounded almost as though you would ally justice with certain kinds of principles we might very much like, like solidarity or concern or uh, uh, you know, a, a sort of being at one with the poor. Now, I, I know that you see much more injustice than that, and yet uh, the way in which you then went on to the historical question was one as though we might ask ourselves how we found ourselves in this predicament as though it could be answered in terms of a, a long and sweeping history. But I think if we, if we look at justice a little bit differently as something that is never included, is never representational, that is in fact associated more with the event uh, and with singularity, then we, we can, I think, get at some of the responses and some of the, the interesting aspects of, uh, of Joseph's book, that things can change their, uh, their relationship with justice over time. Justice is, is attached to the decision of a moment. Uh, it doesn't, uh, the, the, the justice that a building or, or sanitation has at one time may not uh, be infinitely reproducible just because we reproduce the spaces. So 
I think if we're going to ask for the question about the relationship of justice to building, we have to keep this, this sense of justice's singularity in mind when we pose the question, rather than imagining that it's something that can be discussed as though it were part of a long way in history. Yeah. Shall I just take that as a comment? Can you speak to the mic? Uh, th th I think the idea of justice is continuous, universal, and unchanging. It's just a matter of who has access to justice. Um, the representation of justice, it seems to me, is always and everywhere the same. Can you, can you elaborate on that? What do you mean <laughs> it's always everywhere the same? What do you mean? Well, imagine a society that was um, ruled by a savage elite uh, who repressed um, a, a serfdom um, and a slave class, uh, there would be an injustice there. But amongst themselves, as peers, uh, they would deal with themselves according to the rule of justice. And um, the concept of justice that would prevail among those peers uh, would be no different from a universal justice of the kind that we would recognize. Um, that's why I think it's possible to admire uh, the buildings erected by um, ideologies uh, whose values we would otherwise despise. Uh, because at some level, within their own um, uh, framework, they have to act according to those values. Uh, and I think it's also why it's very important that cities begin not with the sanitation and drainage, but with the representation of the civic values at the most monumental and um, essential kind. In a certain way, I think it's more important for a city to have a, uh, a group of buildings that um, are abidingly inspirational than to have anything else. They become totemic and they inspire following generations. Well, of course I like that, but uh, I think what we must remember is that um, housing uh, used to be something that architects were not really concerned with. Architects were concerned with the form of the city and its fences and its entries and exits, and they were concerned with its public institutions, with um, palaces, with uh, law courts, with churches, with markets, and so on. Uh, Houses, people built more or less for themselves according to a type. I've always thought that there was not such, no such thing as vernacular architecture, that people always thought before they built. So in that sense, there is no such thing as instinctive architecture. Uh, architecture always requires thought. And that is why, of course, architecture is always political. Building is always political, because it always requires thought. And once it requires thought, it puts on you the burden of thinking of right. I'm not sure that I take Brian Justice uh, as being immutable and always the same, quite at face value, but I would like to think that he's right. Anyway, uh, so, But I think he's absolutely right. Um, this is why I say we have allowed the unconscious to rule the city. We have pretended that we are entirely rational, but in fact it's the sewers which govern the city it's the unconscious, it's the, it's the belly which governs the city and not the institutions and not a sense of justice. And I think in that sense, we have a long way to go yet to achieve a relationship between, a dialectical relationship between the conscious and the unconscious in the city, which Richard in a sense is asking for. Um, perhaps not formulated quite in that way, but I think Mm -hmm. I couldn't disagree with you more. Oh, good. <laughs> right. um, I, I really, oh, I can't, I'll never leave. <laughs> I simply couldn't disagree with you more. I think that um, I think actually environments that work. I didn't believe in pattern language. You know the. Christopher Alexander kind of stuff. 
But I think urban environments that work well for ordinary people are environments which lack monumentality, which are unconscious, which are taken for granted, uh, and which seem very simple. And as in any art, creating that sense of simplicity is, of course, the greatest artifice. Uh, if you think about, for instance, i just give you a musical analogy. i I'll tell you a story about this. I had a friend uh, with whom I uh, wrote a book once, and we finished a book, and we decided we'd go out to a concert to celebrate. And we went to hear Murray Pariah play uh, the Schubert B-flat sonata. Incredible. And my friend listened to this performance, and he said, God, that was fantastic. And you know, it's just, I think I want to learn the piano. It was so direct and so easy. It's at that point I understood how great a pianist Murray Pariah was. And I think the art of building is rather like that art of playing the piano. How to create things where people think, yes, this is available to me. This is open to me. This is something I can get into. There's no barrier. Now, of course, it's an illusion. It's an artifice. It requires a really great architect to do that, just as it requires a great pianist. But that, to me, is when a city really works. I think you two are agreeing, not disagreeing. Um, I, of course. I hope not. I hope. <laughs> of course, of course you are agreeing, because ultimately it is the artifice which is at the heart of the architect's operation. Of course it must seem easy and obvious, but it must be very difficult to do. Well then, my and dear, when you look I at... Oh, no, I no, you can't. Yes, I... Because, <laughs> you see, what defeats you, in fact, is the Georgian Terrace. Because insofar as it had an invention, was the making public of private habitations. That is, making a palace out of a group of middle-class dwellings. That's how it starts. So it's making it, giving it that public face, and putting columns at either end and in the middle. And then, of course, columns get left off and becomes Gow Street. But, uh, but the, the, the primary instinct is that of making a public statement out of, out of the private concern. Yes. I know it's the cocktail hour. There, there are a lot of questions here. I want to get some questions quickly. Gaspar, back there, is there, or maybe, well, no, but people over they won't here be able to hear you. you shout. So uh, can you please pass this mic very quickly? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, in relation to uh, whether cities should show justice being done, I would like to bring the conversation back to uh, prisons in the city. And uh, in Buenos Aires, for example, there is a very famous prison which where the prisoners have made holes in the walls. Uh, and it, they turn the prison in a sort of gruyere cheese full of holes. And through these holes, the prisoners are able to talk to their relatives in the street. So the prison is always surrounded by hundreds of people talking to their relatives in the prison. In this prison, the illusion and the, of the facade and the reality of the interior are exactly the same. You can see how the prison is like and what is happening there. In London, there are seven prisons, which I think they are quite invisible. And I would like to, I wonder if you can probably um, talk a little bit about um, which is the role of the prisons in cities today. Uh, at the moment, most of the London prisons are Victorian and the city has developed quite naturally around them. And it is only when a new uh, hostel intends to uh, be created in the city that protests uh, arouse. I wonder if you can discuss the role of the prisons inside the cities. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of you may know uh, the acronym NIMBY. 
uh, which stands for Not in My Backyard, which is what many people feel about prisons. Uh, they have to have them in the city, but they don't want them anywhere near their homes. Uh, and it's only in 19th century cities that uh, prisons were situated visibly and were making also, in some cases, a point about justice. Quite surprising and unfortunate that you present uh, this term justice uh, as a pure substance. And when we know it is one of the most vicious and, and dangerous aspects of reality, your example, your monument, you, you want us to talk about the left of, I think, ideology, uh, monument, and justice. Well, that monument you showed us proves the injustice of the situation, i.e., people who own the houses, who can aspire to live there and have their meetings are 100% are so different to the people who were put up on this monument and, and killed and disfigured. And, and the reason, the way that you can present this is because you totally ignore class struggle and power struggle. And, and can I just point to another very famous example of architecture and the question of justice, the burning of the Reichstag uh, in the early uh, part of the 1933 was used by the, the Nazi uh, system to, to create new laws which put people like communists or intellectuals and, and, and others uh, possibly opposed to, to Nazi into prison, into concentration camps, and, and that to incredible development. Now, that was justice. And at the point of justice, there was total injustice. And if you don't present the term justice with this background, we, we are totally lost. It's very unfortunate that in cities, we have to have police. I don't like it, but um, I think if we didn't have um, a system, some sort of form by which what we understand as a codification of our relationships is, is governed, we would find it rather difficult to live in the city. Cities have always had, however unjust they were, have always had some sort of systematic understanding of how people relate to each other. And I, I noticed, Gustav, that you, uh, you classify people who are in danger as communists and intellectuals and others, but communists and intellectuals are obviously equivalent classes. Um, and of course that is exactly what they did, what the Nazis did when the Reichstag was burned. They used the burning not of a court of justice, but of the central, what should have been, the central um, forum of public debate. They use the destruction of that as the excuse for further oppression. But a forum of public debate is something that the city always needs. And that forum must be visible to all the citizens and must be in some way respected. And therefore, it will always be in some way monumental. However humble it may look. And I'm afraid there we may disagree. But I think the monument is not avoidable. May, may I say that Joseph speaks as this is really uh, the attention to ceremony in your work and to the ceremonial is where Joseph, I just, this is just a comment maybe to end evening with this. Uh, the social scientists who, who read Joseph Rickwood's work, the most carefully are anthropologists. And I think the reason for that is that what he's done is try to locate exactly the importance of ceremony in the generation of uh, social and cultural forms. And were we to stay
stay another few hours, what would be interesting to talk about is whether really people, we could create a just city without ceremony. And that was a dream of many urbanists, socialist urbanists, a century ago. And they weren't able to create, they created arid cities without ceremony. But I think the question in some way, some way always ahead of the way of justice, it's terribly unfair, is, is the ceremonials we have in modern cities are dreadful. They are shopping, or the kinds of things you show in your book of this kitsch kind of seaside and so on. This is a society that stripped away ceremony. But you know, maybe that's a game somewhere. And maybe a different kind of more modest, ordinary life could be made without the monument of the city. And that's, that's at least my hope. When you get rid of a monument of the city and the ceremonies of justice order and control that contains. It seems to me really an act of freeing the city. I, I, I'm, I'm sure we're not going to uh, end up with a clear kind of agreement. I know that there are many other people who want to ask questions. Uh, whether you have the monumental city or the non-monumental city, it's still a form of representation of that non-monument. And I, I, I think that, the, in a sense, the positive thing with all the disagreements that hopefully will come from the book is really the, the question of kind of um, uh, responsibility and the act of, of construction itself uh, as, a, as a public project, as a public act, uh, in, in, in the sense that architecture is not, uh, it's not a private um, operation and it's by definition, I mean we've talked about the political, but in fact it's by definition also a kind of public uh, project. And I think the awareness of that, that relationality between the act of construction and its, uh, and its public um, uh, position is something that, uh, that I'm sure we can, uh, we can uh, get a lot from not only this book, but uh, as I think Richard has uh, said from many of uh, um, other uh, of, uh, of Joseph's books. I want to thank uh, Richard and Joseph Rickworth and all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you.